We will be recording this session so that we can ensure that uh, any recording notes can be sent out ap after the session. That being said, let, let us um, pause the music and we will get started. Yeah. Hello, my friends. On behalf of the production team and the presenter team today, I'd love to introduce our MC for the session. Camille Parker. Uh, she's an economist at USAID Center for Economics and Economic and Market Development. Um, which uh, here she focuses on connect conducting economic analyses re related to job creation, inclusive growth, and cost effects effectiveness. Prior to working at USAID, Camille held a variety of research-related roles at the World Bank's Development Impact Evaluation Group, D-I-N-E, or DIME, uh, Save the Children, Innovations for Poverty Action, and Deloitte. Camille holds a master's degree in international development from Georgetown University and a bachelor's in public policy from Vanderbilt University. Um, so we are honored to have her with us today. Camille, over to you. Thank you so much, Janina. Um, and good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. And welcome to the August Market Links webinar on overcoming barriers to LGBTQI plus market participation, innovative programs for economic empowerment and inclusive growth. As Janina said, my name is Camille Parker and I'm an economist at USAID's Center for Economic and Economics and Market Development. And I'm really pleased to be emceeing this important conversation today. Um, Market Links is a USAID program that supports a broad array of knowledge sharing tools, strategies, and monthly events. So do be sure to check out marketlinks.org for content along a wide range of issues from pathways out of poverty to mobilizing private capital, market facilitation to models for reaching scale. We are particularly proud this month to be partnering with the Inclusive Development Hub at USAID to explore the important topic of inclusion of LGBTQI people in economic growth programming. LGBTQI plus stands for lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, intersex, and other people of diverse genders and sexualities. And we acknowledge and honor that LGBTQI plus people exist in every country, every society, and every culture around the world. Due to stigma, discrimination, violence, and criminalization, and a variety of other factors that we're going to learn about today, LGBTQI people may be excluded from activities and programs that aim to expand economic opportunity and strengthen market systems. Fortunately, there is a wide breadth of expertise from civil society stakeholders and human rights defenders across the world that we can draw from and learn from today and into the future. So before we kick off this important topic, I'm very pleased to invite Senior Deputy Assistant Administrator Maura Berry to deliver some framing remarks from the USAID leadership perspective. Maura Berry serves in USAID's Bureau for Resilience and Food Security, which leads the US government's global water strategy and global food security strategy. She also serves as the agency's interim global water coordinator. Maura Berry oversees USAID's strategic direction and partnerships, operations and programming to reduce global hunger, poverty, and malnutrition, while increasing the availability and sustainable management of safe water and sanitation for all. As a career member of the Senior Foreign Service, Mora has held a variety of leadership positions throughout the agency, including assignments in Jamaica, Thailand, Afghanistan, Kenya, covering Somalia, Djibouti, and Burundi. Mora has been working in international development for over 30 years and started her journey as a Peace Corps volunteer in Western Kenya. Over to you, Mora. Thank you, Camille. Thanks for that uh, lovely introduction and good morning to, uh, I guess, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone. and Welcome to this webinar. Thank you for joining us. I'm really so honored to, to be with you and to kick off this what I know is gonna be a really exciting discussion on overcoming barriers to LGBTQI+. You know, I've had the opportunity to work on this issue when I was based in the Caribbean in Jamaica and, and before that in Asia. And it's so good to be here today with all of you to talk about inclusion in the context of food and water security. And I was really excited to see everybody signing in. And uh, I saw actually a lot of familiar names uh, popping into this meeting. We've got a, a great crowd. Um, I think we all are aware that inclusion is one of USAID's core values 
And around the world, we strive to apply inclusion principles to all our development humanitarian programs. Inclusive development, of course, is a concept that every person, regardless of their identity, is instrumental in transforming their societies. And this means thinking about how social and structural factors contribute to the marginalization and exclusion of specific populations. This may include women and girls, persons with disabilities, indigenous peoples, young people, racial, ethnic, and religious minorities, migrants and lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, and intersex people. I had the opportunity I wanted to share with you to participate in an event last May and learn about uh, a Feed the Future activity in the Western Highlands of Guatemala. And this activity is called Mashrigo. And Mashrigo took inclusive considerations very seriously. And that made a really important difference in the program. Mashrigo worked to increase the incomes and the use of climate smart strategies among farmers from indigenous communities. And it also tapped a local LGBTQI plus led organization to develop and provide program staff with training on human rights. And that included discussions on the, of the local LGBT community to ensure their ability to also participate in benefit. And Mashrigo is, is one project of many that underscores the simple truth that incorporating inclusivity in the development process yields better incomes. I want to remind us of uh, 2014 when USAID released the LGBT vision for action. And that was uh, to reflect our commitment to promoting and protecting the human rights of the LGBTQI plus people in countries where we work. I think this was a really important moment for USAID. And the vision that it laid out guided USAID to, I'm gonna just uh, walk us through a few things. One, to account for country and cultural context. It guided us to ensure openness and safe space for dialogue, to support and mobilize LGBTQI plus led civil society organizations to integrate considerations of sexual orientation, gender identity, gender expression, and sex characteristics into programming, and to build partnerships and create allies and champions on this issue. And now where we are today, importantly, we know that the Biden-Harris administration has unequivocally supported the rights of the LGBTQI plus people here at home in the US and around the world. On his very first day in office, President Biden issued an executive order on preventing and combating discrimination based on gender identity or sexual orientation. And this executive order has really catalyzed USAID and all US government agencies to critically review our personnel policies to ensure that all employees and our partners have the opportunity to thrive. I think we'd say that President Biden has really set the bar high across US government to be really championing this issue. And one pillar of the memorandum calls on all US agencies involved in foreign assistance to ensure that LGBTQI plus rights are protected and are promoted. I also wanna make reference to um, 2016 when USAID required non-discrimination against beneficiaries in all of our grant and contract agreements. And these non-discrimination protections explicitly include sexual orientation and gender identity. It's really critical component of our agreement with partners to ensure that no one faces discrimination from projects that are funded by USAID. But of course, non-discrimination protections alone that's not enough, right? Non-discrimination is simply the absence of something bad. And that cannot be the bar that we hold ourselves to. I think if we don't intentionally and proactively include, then we will unintentionally exclude. And therefore we really have to take proactive and intentional, be very intentional uh, in our steps to include marginalized groups. Over the years, and I'm sure many on this call have one way or another been involved in uh, 
partnerships that USAID has supported that have advanced the human rights and economic inclusion of LGBTQI plus people around the world. And just to reflect on a few of those, one uh, important uh, initiative is in partnership with the National LGBT Chambers of Commerce, USAID supported the establishment of five LGBTI chambers of commerce and business networks around the world. And these chambers have not only provided essential support to LGBTQI plus business owners and small enterprises, they've also built the capacity of activities to engage with corp corporations to increase supplier diversity. USAID also supports a multi-donor LGBTI global human rights initiative that we refer to the acronym as GHRI. And with co-funding from the governments of Sweden and Canada, uh, as well as some funding from private foundations, the GHRI is supporting local efforts to protect LGBTQI plus people from violence, discrimination, stigma, and criminalization. And additionally, our USAID missions around the world fund and manage projects that address human rights challenges and opportunities for LGBTQI plus people in a wide range of USAID sectors. And it's through these programs that we have been able to learn that targeted efforts to provide sustainable economic livelihoods are essential to close, to close those development gaps that trap LGBTQI plus people in poverty and in ill health. And so in my role as the Senior Deputy Assistant Administrator for the Bureau of Resilience and Food Security, and as USAID's Interim Global Water Coordinator, I really am aware of how important it is for our programs to integrate considerations of sexual orientation, gender identity, and expression, and sex characteristics to address these realities. In agriculture, in nutrition, water security, in our sanitation and hygiene, in our resilience programming, we have to uh, take measures to be very intentional to ensure that we're not unintentionally excluding LGBTI uh, people. So currently we're working on uh, updating our global food security strategy and later this year we'll begin updating our uh, water, water for the world strategy. And as part of the update, we recognize the need to elevate addressing increasing inequality through inclusive development of approaches. And as part of these effort, efforts, I'm really pleased today to announce that USAID is releasing a new sectoral document on strategies and promising practices, resources for integrating LGBTQI plus considerations into resilience and food water security programming. And this document will provide an overview of USAID's approach to this topic and highlight several interesting findings and transformative programs. Uh, so we trust that uh, this will be a useful resource for everyone uh, that's here today on the call and, and beyond. So just in, close, in my closing remarks, I wanna reiterate that although there may be tremendous gaps in research on LGBTQI plus development needs, there's of course tremendous opportunities. And the expertise of civil society activists, including those that you're going to get to hear from today that are on our panel, is really outstanding. So we at USAID recognize that we have a lot to learn from the resourcefulness and innovation of LGBTQI plus people around the world. And we're so fortunate to hear from our speakers about the creative ways that they have contributed to the economic livelihoods and market participation of their diverse communities. And I'm sure that we'll all uh, be inspired by what we, from what we hear from them today. So thank you for the opportunity to kick this off and, and pass it back to you. Thank you so much, Maura. Um, it's so great to hear about the prioritization of human rights and inclusion of LGBTQI plus people at USAID and across the US government. Um, we'll be sure to share a link to the resource Maura mentioned, integrating LGBTQI plus considerations into resilience and food security programming to everyone who's registered for this event. I think Maura's overview was useful to understand the ways that USAID approaches this work and to think about how we can better support the LGBTQI plus community in our development programming. We're now very fortunate to welcome Clifton Cortez, the World Bank's first ever global advisor on sexual orientation and gender identity, 
for a presentation about issues affecting LGBTQI plus labor market participation and to moderate our really exciting panel today. CLIP currently leads efforts at the World Bank to try to ensure that borrower governments address inclusion and non-discrimination in bank finance development projects. He also leads the bank's sexual orientation, gender identity, gender expression, and sex characteristics <laughs> data generation efforts as part of building the evidence base for LGBTQI plus inclusion. Previously, Cliff served as the United Nations Development Program's De Deputy Director for Health and UNDP's Global LGBTQI Lead. Prior to working at UNDP, he was part of USAID's HIV response, first as part of the Office of HIV in Washington, DC, and later in the Regional Development Mission in Asia in Bangkok, including with a focus on gay, bi, and other men who have sex with men and transgender women. So we're so pleased to welcome a USAID alum to moderate this discussion today. Thank you so much for joining us, Cliff, and on to you. Absolutely, thank you, and good day to all my friends, queer colleagues uh, who are out there around the world and joining us today for this exciting conversation. It's gonna be an interesting conversation, I know, because I've spoken to the panelists. And actually, the first thing I wanna do is I wanna actually acknowledge and thank the panelists, and I'm gonna introduce each of them before I make a few remarks and then we get into the panel discussion. So if the panelists could put on your cameras so that people can see who you are if they don't know you already. I'm gonna first introduce uh, our first panelist, Gurchatan Sandhu, his pronouns are he and they, and he is the program officer on non-discrimination at the International Labor Organization, the ILO. And he's also the president of UN Globe, a voluntary activist advocacy organization of the UN staff trying to ensure equitable and fair treatment of people who are staff and who are LGBTQI plus people. Uh, Nanu, uh, no, known to many as, as, as Nanu, but I'll refer to you today as Gurchatan. I also want to introduce Zimkita Guma. Her pronouns are she and her, and she's the manager at PLUS, the LGBTI business network in South Africa. We also have with us Kong Yara, he, him, or his pronouns, and he's the Cambodia project coordinator at the Micro Rainbow International Foundation. And among its focus is LGBTI-centered economic empowerment. I also want to introduce Barbara Wangare. Her pronouns are she and her. Executive Director at East African Trans Health and Advocacy Network, Ethan, a network of trans-diverse activists and organizations in East Africa. And finally, I want to welcome Craig Paris. His pronoun, their pronouns are he and they. Executive Director at the Refugee Coalition of East Africa, which is an umbrella organization uniting LGBT refugees across East Africa. So thank you all for being with us today. And now I'm gonna just make a few remarks before we go into our panel discussion, if that's okay, because that panel discussion has context. And that context is the stigma, discrimination, and too often violence that leads to the exclusion of LGBTQI plus people from the processes and fruits of development and economic growth. I just wanna say something about my own institution, the World Bank, which issued a seminal report from 2013, Inclusion Matters, the Foundation for Shared Prosperity, uh, in which they, we tried to de both define social inclusion and unpack it. I'll also note it happened to also be the first World Bank global analytical product that brought in the issue of LGD, LGBT people. Uh, I'll also recommend to you the, the, the follow-on report from 2019, Inclusion Matters in Africa, which actually takes on the issue of LGBT people and inclusion in Africa more solidly. So Inclusion Matters told us that inclusion is both a process and it's an outcome. In terms of the process, it's a process of improving the terms and conditions of individuals and groups to take part in society. It's about equality. And what is it inclusion in? Inclusion in what? Inclusion Matters told us that it's inclusion in markets, services, and spaces. And all of these are relevant for our discussion today, but I have a feeling we're gonna especially be focusing on the issue of markets. I also wanna note that in 2015, 
UNDP led a process with quite a number of stakeholders, including a lot of LGBTQI plus NGOs uh, to sort of address the question of the fact that exclusion based on SOGSC is prevalent in every sector, every development sector. And therefore, can we get some consensus on those sectors that we should focus on together and make a priority? And um, those priorities that came out of that process were education, health, civic and political participation, addressing violence, and especially important for our discussion today, economic, what they defined as economic well-being. The University of Massachusetts Amherst economist, Dr. Lee Badgett, who I actually noted happens to be with us today, so I'm happy she's here, drew the connection between LGBT exclusion and costs to economies in her 2016 paper in which she used the human capital theory from labor economics to illustrate that skills, ability, knowledge, and health all shape individual productivity. And that LGBT discrimination exclusion reduce human capital and thus negatively impact economies. Now, data is a challenge, but where we have some robust data in places such as the US, we know that discrimination and exclusion lead to higher rates of poverty among LGBTQI plus people. Simply put, discrimination too often prevents LGBTQI plus people from finding or keeping a job or a means to make a living. So I'm hopeful today that we're gonna address a range of issues that encompass the re realities and challenges for queer people as relates to the labor markets and economic growth from access to capital and economic empowerment to discriminatory laws that create barriers to economic opportunity to partnerships with the private sector. And we'll be addressing key parts of our community, specifically trans diverse people, lesbian, gay and bi women, refugees. We're also gonna be addressing how COVID has impacted the work and all of this among other issues. So let's turn to our panelists and the first question. The first question is gonna be the same question, to each of the panelists. And I'm gonna give you each five minutes to respond to that question. I'll cue you when it's your turn. And I'm gonna remind you of some rules. You've got five minutes and I'm gonna to need to hold you to the five minutes because we wanna make sure that everybody has equal time to get their issues out on the table. When we get to the Q and A, we're gonna cut down the answer time to three, four minutes at most because we have a number of questions we'll wanna pose and a number of those will be coming in from folks who are listening in right now through the chat. So we wanna make sure we get to those. So I'll ask you to bear with me if I cut in on you and ask you to bring it to, to close it up. So let's get started. Our question for all five panelists to kick us off is simply, can you tell us about a project or a program that you are particularly proud of how did the program address barriers to LGBTQI labor market participation and what, make the program, what makes the program successful? And we're gonna start with you, Nanu. Thank you very much, uh, Cliff. And uh, once again, a big thank you to USAID for inviting the ILO to participate in today's session. And um, yeah, let me get started. I only have five minutes, so on the clock now. Um, I also want to acknowledge that you know, I'll be sharing one of the um, ILO's examples from the um, Brasilia office in Brazil. And I'll be sharing the great work of my colleague, Thais Dume, who is on the call today as well, uh, who has been fiercely leading this project as well as others on non-discrimination in Brazil. So um, Cliff talked about contextualization, and I think it's very, very important that we put some contextualization around this project that we've launched. Um, we've uh, launched in 2015-16 and has been very successful to date, um, that we're very, very proud of. Um, so the context in which we're operating is, is in Brazil, um, and the project in itself, um, well, the background of Brazil is it's very interesting. 
it's very paradoxical to say, you know, you have very interesting laws, very uh, open uh, laws that protect LGBTIQ plus people, um, that provide protections for, uh, that criminalize homophobia, biphobia and homophobia and transphobia that also provide um, marriage equality in some cases as well. But this is also very interesting in the fact that it's one of the first few countries that has, has a national action plan on the employment of LGBTI people in Latin America. So on one side, great policies, great laws, but on another side, we have cultural stereotypes, um, which have, have had profound impacts on LGBTIQ plus people, in particular on trans persons. We know that up to 68% of LGBTIQ plus people have reported of experiencing discrimination in the workplace. Trans people are 10 times more likely to be unemployed and have even been denied employment in Brazil based on their gender identity. In 2018, a bit of a trigger warning here, 163 trans persons were reported to be murdered. In 2020 alone, within the first nine months, this figure was 150. It is no surprise then that the average life expectancy of trans people is 34 years old. 90% of trans people in Brazil use sex work as a source of income and subsistence. Now, knowing that these are the situations, the Kitchen and Voice program uh, project that we're very um, proud of came to about in 2015, in 2016. It's a project that where we have partnered together with, with pa um, Paula Coracella, a big chef in Brazil. Um, perhaps the US equivalent of that would be Thomas Keller or the UK equivalent would be Gordon Ramsay, a famous leading chef in Brazil who knows the industry very, very well. Um, partnered with the ILO to develop a program on kitchen and voice. So there's a two part program, one on kitchen assistance and one on, on voice. Um, let me go through those. Kitchen assistance, um, here is a technical skills-based program providing um, our project beneficiaries with skills training on um, basic skills for working in a restaurant kitchen, including salad dressing techniques, preparation of fish, meat and vegetables, waste handling and food storage. Why as a kitchen assistant? Well, it's a good labor market option because it have different opportunities. It could lead to work in hospitals, in restaurants, in businesses, even catering. Um, and it's also a qualification that does not require any formal qualification. As we know that many LGBTIQ plus people in Brazil, especially trans persons, miss out on formative years of formal education and lack the very basic education to gain a professional qualification. So consequently, this uh, program is actually linked to a national um, training program, which provides a certification for um, employment into the formal market and can be recognized across Brazil. Um, sorry. And then with poetry, the second part of the program is to work with feeling and using poetry to prepare um, the beneficiaries with job, uh, with basic um, skills, such as how to, uh, with job interviews, how to deal with coworkers and how to have other forms of commu um, communication. It also helps them with social norms and not to use violence and understand that they have qualities and consequently builds their self-esteem. To date, we have trained 477 beneficiaries, 80% of them who have gone on into formal employment and actually have um, landed employment in um, restaurants or in kitchens or in other businesses. This is also thanks to um, Paola's net extensive network, but also with the ILO's program and linking with uh, multinationals and businesses in the country. Many of the, uh, those partners, those beneficiaries who did not actually go into formal um, um, business, uh, go into formal employment, were supported then to start their own businesses and become uh, professional caterers. I believe is my time up there, Cliff. You're getting very close. We're getting very like close. 30 okay. seconds. Okay. So um, what we've also do is then we've um, supported companies where or workplaces where um, our beneficiaries will be going into. So providing training for that to ensure that the environments that they're going to be working in are also free from violence, non just um, um, how free from discrimination and are inclusive and equitable for, for our beneficiaries as well.
Great. Thank you, Nanu, uh, for telling us about that program. I think we're going to come back with some specific questions on that in the Q&A. Uh, now I'd like to invite Zemkitha Guma. Remember, she's the program manager at PLUS, the LGBTI business network in South Africa. And Kim, uh, uh, Zemkitha, it will be great to hear from you about a program that you're proud of, and I know you have a PowerPoint, so terrific. Okay, thank you so much, Clifton, for this opportunity. Um, like you have um, introduced us, I manage a program um, that supports LGBTI-owned businesses. Uh, what we do as PLUS is, um, you know, as we all know that LGBTI-owned uh, businesses are often discriminated. So what we do is we, the services that we provide for our members. In fact, we have a membership of about 200 members. It's over 200 members. And we have uh, approximately 15 corporates. I'm just trying to open my lens. Okay, there you go. Um, I don't know if you'll be able to land my slides, but our background is we are a registered NPO with the South African Department of Social Development. We were established in 2016 by the other foundation and we were formally registered in 2018. And our network sp spreads across the whole of South Africa. We currently have more than 200 businesses. That is our suppliers registered within our database. And we've got 19, about 19 co corporate partners. Um, what we do is our mission, it is to champion, to promote, support and empower South African LGBTI business owners and entrepreneurs with valuable opportunities to learn, network, do business, prosper, and contribute to the, we also, by contributing to the redress of the structural and in, in economic injustices of our past. And our vision as PLUS is to build a dynamic, thriving, and business, a visible South African LGBTI business community for an inclusive and free equitable society. Also what we do, the way we do, in fact, our focus areas is advocacy to create fair, equitable, and inclusive business environments to support LGBTI businesses. We do this by vetting of LGBTI business suppliers, uh, we are working towards a certification program because I know most um, international uh, LGBTI um, chambers, they do a certification program, but at the moment we just vet the LGBTI suppliers and we offer enterprise supplier development programs for our members and by supporting the establishment and strengthening of LGBTI inclusive workplace and we also our, one of our focus areas is providing networking opportunities. So what we do, the services that we offer to our members, we offer business training and workshops, uh, business to business matchmaking events, mentoring and coaching opportunities and registration also on the NGLCC. International Supplier Database, uh, as it was mentioned before that USAID is also, they support the NGLCC, we are one of those beneficiaries. They have played a huge role in our existence. And we also provide them, our members with regular communication on developments and opportunities. Um, and also very important linkage to corporate supplier diversity uh, programs. Um, so what we also do, what we big on is the, we're pushing the agenda of inclusive procurement. And one of the vehicles that affords us that ability to achieve this inclusive procurement is supplier diversity. Uh, as I've mentioned before, we are part of approximately 20 corporate organizations or allies. Um, which are called the round table. So what we do is we source uh, RFQs and RFPs from these corporates and make these available to our members. And also, um, like I've mentioned before, our membership, our members, they, we do what we call a self-registry process. 
they register themselves. In fact, if you're interested to become a member, you register in our, um, you send us an email, we send you an application form. Um, <clears throat> as mentioned before, there's no certification at the moment, but we are working towards that. Um, and also uh, what we do President is- Peter, We're coming to time. Is it? I think I'm done. I think I'm almost done. And also what we do also every year, we host a, an annual business, LGBTI business summit, which is coming up on the 4th of November. So that is also one of the vehicles we use to for networking opportunities and also to introduce our access to markets for our members. I think I'm done. Thank Terrific. you. Absolutely. And you guys are obviously very busy uh, trying to address the corporate agendas, and that's exciting. So thank you, Zimkita. We'd like to now invite Craig Paris, another panelist. And remember, he's the executive director of the Refugees Coalition of East Africa. Craig, over to you. Thank you so much, Clifton. Uh, thank you for having me on this discussion. I'm really privileged to be here uh, to represent my community, the LGBTIQ refugee and migrants community back here in Kenya. Um, one program that I'm really um, proud of is the livelihoods program that we started uh, back three years back when we even founded the coalition. We are an umbrella organization that unites uh, several community-based organizations that support LGBTQ refugees as they wait for the uh, settlement. Um, so when we started, one of the needs that we had was the need for sustainability, the need for people to have incomes, to have um, projects or activities that generate daily income so that they can be able to put even food on their table and pay their rent and cover personal expenses. So one of those first things that we came up with was to, to start up um, the livelihood program, and we started it off with giving cash grants to four projects uh, that included poultry, a business a restaurant, we included uh, the craft making, and we included the bid work. So after that, we decided to scale it up by contacting even other people or potential supporters. And up to now, we have created um, a program that is helping LGBTQ refugees to empower them economically. Uh, and this program right now, uh, on the, we are on the second phase. And in this phase, we are creating more trainings. Uh, we just concluded our trainings in uh, sales marketing by Salesforce. And we are also creating more capital base. We gave out previously, we've just given out to a lot of cash grants to, to a lot of project, new projects and we, on top of the existing ones. So this is a very prideful moment for us as a community here in Kenya, knowing that we have a program that caters for our financial benefit and financial empowerment. Back to you. Very concise, Craig. Thank you so much. And it's really good to hear about your focus on the economic well-being of refugees. This is a, we know this is a huge gap in lots of programs, including multilateral programs like the World Bank's. Um, so we'll next move on. And I'm going to now ask our next panelist to speak, Barbara Wangare. Remember, she's the executive director of Ethan, the East Africa Trans Health and Advocacy Network. And I'm turning it over to you, Barbara, to tell us about uh, a program that you're excited about and proud of. Yeah, thank you so much for the opportunity. I hope you can hear me. We hear you great. Thank you. So yeah, yeah, my name is Barbara and um, I'm not going to continue. No, you've been able to do the introductions. And I just realized that my presentation that I prepared might go over the five minutes. So I'll try and cut it short. Um, so just in, the, in terms of a background, we do understand that there is heightened discrimination against trans and gender diverse persons in the labor markets. And there is quite a number of issues that trans people face in this, in this sector because of various things such as um, a really limited education that um, trans and gender diverse persons face. And I just wanted to also say that 
um, I agree with what um, Sandu was saying about trans people engaging in sex work. We did a study here in East Africa. We found that more than 60% of trans women engage in sex work as their primary source of income. And with now with the coronavirus, it really exacerbated a lot of these issues among the trans community. It pushed a lot of people out of jobs, out of their sources of income. And a lot of, a lot of the community had to go back home to places, to, to spaces where they were not accepted, spaces where they were discriminated by their own family. And we have seen a large increase in the number of um, mental health struggles among the community. Be that as it may, we have um, very good examples of ways in which that the community has tried to generate income for themselves. Um, one of the ex examples that I can give is that one of our members in Uganda actually came up with a, a source of income income generating activity. So one, one of the activists disc, you know, realizing that the community was struggling financially, that people were struggling to get jobs and start businesses or even maintain those businesses, um, used his uh, savings to purchase a piece of land um, somewhere in the outskirts of Kampala in a rural area where he, start, he just started setting up the space, um, putting together structures so that he can um, begin rearing pigs and, and do pig farming and also plant crops that are, you know, like horticultural crops that were very, you know, on demand in the community and especially in the, in the capital city of Kampala. He then employed trans people who would be able to do the job on the ground and on the, on the farm. And they've had quite a number of successes. I mean, obviously, when you think about um, such small businesses, they do take time to keep up and to, to pick up. And he was able to do a private fundraising effort, you know, using GoFundMe to be able to support that period when they were growing and, and he got a good um, response. Um, eventually, I think this is about two years ago, eventually they were able to break even, they were able to, to actually sell their, 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 you know, their crops, they were able to sell, you know, pigs for, for pork meat, and we've seen that the they've had quite a good success in their project. They've so much success that they were able to save up money and purchase binders from the US for trans, trans men who really needed binders. And this was their own effort. There was no um, donor funding from any organization that provides funding. This was an entirely you know, community-led effort. We've also had an example of one of our one of our members here in Kenya, where these the you know one of the people who are doing artwork came up with an idea to create beautiful flower pots from towels. And these flower pots have a very unique design. They could be sized differently. You could have one that you could put in your house or maybe another one that you could put in your office. And they designed them in a way that was um, lightweight and, and accessible for many people. They started selling these flower pots to organizations. They sold them through social media, especially on Instagram. And people were able to purchase these this flower pots and using the income that was generated from these um, flower pots, especially because the capital was provided by the organization and not necessarily from the artisan. And so when, we, when they were able to generate that income, the income went to the, to the artists that were doing, that were creating these flower pots. And also some of the income was went towards the organization in organizing activities that were not covered by, uh, sorry, yeah. That went into covering activities that were not funded by traditional funders. This is a very, these two, two examples have been really instrumental in 
you know, giving that impetus and, 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 and inspiring our other members across the region to come up with different ways of source of, of, of uh, doing business, different ways of supporting the community and just showing the community that despite the challenges that they are facing in this region, despite the challenges that they experience in, you know, in the job market, in the labor market, that it is possible to do something that can generate income for yourself without necessarily compromising your identity, without necessarily making yourself invisible, hiding your true self, just so that you can survive in this community. And I think that inspiring stories are going a long way. And we as a, we as a network are supporting our members in every way that we can. We've been documenting these experiences and these activities. We are setting up, um, you know, community, community support meetings with them so that they can learn from each other. We've um, created Hi, avenues Barbara. where, <laughs> just quickly, Absolutely. we've created no, avenues no. where um, persons who are trans, who have their own businesses, can mentor other persons in the community who are interested in starting their, their um, own businesses. And we've seen some successes that um, where a, a person was be able to tie, was tied to an entrepreneur and they were able to start their own businesses. So I think that's a, that's a positive for us. Thank you. That's, that's a, great, a couple of great examples. And I, you probably didn't notice, but I gave you an extra minute, actually. And you can thank Craig for that because he was so quick in his presentation. He's saving his fire for the Q&A. So oh, now, thank, thank you, Barbara. You. Now let's turn to our last panelist, Kong Yara. Remember, Kong Yara is with the Cambodia Project Coord, uh, Coordinator for Micro Rainbow International. And I think you also have a, a PowerPoint, Yara. Yes. Thank Over you. To you. Yeah, next slide. Next, next slide, please. Okay. Okay. Uh, so the MOI Foundation is a charity that uh, promotes economic empowerment as a new entry point to LGBTIQ equality. So we do so by implementing poverty reduction program focused on LGBTQI worldwide. So we have program in UK and in Brazil. So I would like to share the program in Cambodia that been supporting LGBTQI uh, people living with less than a dollar since 2013 in Cambodia. So we have uh, some approach would like to share. So next slide. Yes, uh, so the first approach is uh, the outreach in the community is a key element of the program. Uh, it is not only important to assess uh, LGBTI people, but also to make them aware of the opportunity that they might have to step out of poverty. So we reach out to them in the city like Phnom Penh, but we also go to meet with them uh, in the village and, and community across uh, Cambodia where poverty is even widespread. So we organize a community meeting uh, where we share about uh, our poverty reduction program and start identifying those who could benefit from our program. So we, we use Facebook, social media, and radio mass media uh, as a useful tool to, to reach them as well. And uh, next slide. It looks like we lost Yara's connection. Is that right? I believe so, Yara. Um, we're not able to hear your audio. The screen froze just before we didn't hear him anymore. So let's give him about 10 seconds. And if he's not able to connect right away, we'll come back to him once he's here. Sounds great, Cliff, thank you. We wanna make sure he has a chance like everybody else to present on hit the program that they're proud of, that Ryko Rainbow is proud of. 
So he may come back and inter interrupt us, but in the meantime, we wanna keep moving ahead. So why don't we go into our Q and A? If, we, if, we, if we're able to reconnect with Yara, we'll come back to his presentation. So I wanna go in the Q and A to a follow-up question to the first panelist. So this is to you, Nanu. You told us about the Kitchen and Voice Initiative. Can you tell us a little bit more about how the, uh, the ILO approach approached this partnership with the Brazilian Public Ministry of Labor at the national and subnational level, because I know you worked at both, and how are LGBTQI plus led organizations involved in the design and implementation of this project? And remember, you'll have three to four minutes. Thank you very much, Cliff. That's a great question. And I think it's important to realize why we um, worked with the Ministry of Labor and um, um, the Public Prosecutor's Office at um, the different levels, at the national, at the federal level, as those who know or are aware of the system in Brazil, it is a federal led state. So we work both at the federal level and at the state level. One well, of the key behind that is the key driver for us is sustainability. It's very important that um, if, that we ensure that there's a project and the program can be um, sustainable for future benefits um, and purposes. That's that's very very important for us, as well as um, for for the for those who do not know the ILO, the ILO is a tripartite organisation. So we made a couple of governments, workers' organisations, and employers. And our key interlocutors are in the government is the Ministry of um, of Labour. The program in itself was financed uh, by the um, the prosecutor's office or the uh, the prosecutor's office, where um, a law that put it was put into place that fined businesses and employers who um, were found to be discriminating, who were found uh, were caught with um, having discriminated against employees. And so the consequence, those fines were collected. And those fines are not accessible as a, as a public fund, but were then given to the ILO to set up a project to actually help those communities that were actually discriminated against. Now, those pro, the, that funding in itself has gone to different vulnerable and marginalized groups within, um, uh, within the project, uh, within the, the ILO's scope. So LGBTIQ plus people are just one group of um, uh, people that we're working with under this project with the Ministry of Labour. We're also working with Afro-descendants, with um, adolescent children who are in um, illicit forms of, uh, of child labour, with um, women uh, who are in um, detention to provide them with economic uh, empowerment. But throughout the programme and in each groups, we are actually mainstreaming LGBTIQ plus people. So even in the uh, Afro-descendant, when working with Afro-descendant uh, people um, and building up their productivity in agricultural production, we're even working with LGBTIQ plus people there as well. Um, and it's very, very important that, you know, this project, and uh, especially the Kitchen and Voices program, is based on the principle of nothing about us without us. So it's very essential for us that we put uh, LGBTIQ plus people at the center and the lead in designing these programs and um, even overseeing them. And there's three ways that we do that. Whenever we enter, um, I mean, we've worked in up to six states uh, in Brazil now. And when we um, identify a potential state to work in, we contact the, 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 the LGBTI organizations in that state to hold consultations with, with, with LGBTIQ plus people in that state. And then consequently, they're involved when we take back that feedback, take back the, the, the reports from those consultations, they're involved with us in those designs. Now we have a, a generic program, but the delivery of those programs is done in consultation with, with LGBTIQ plus people. They're also involved, um, you know, after we did the first batch, in the second, 15 seconds, Nanu. Okay. In the second match, we actually invited some of those LGBTI people to come back and sort of mentor the new beneficiaries and new, uh, new, um, new trainees to the second round of the program. They're also actually involved also by doing so, they, they actually not just um, mentor the program and mentor the beneficiaries, they also look out for any, any issues that may crop up and they report those back to us. Okay, this training, there was an issue here. There was possible wording that was wrong that that, that, that training provider is not using the right uh, language. For example, we have an issue here of uh, discrimination. So that, that gets reported back to us. So it's really important for us that LGBTIQ plus people actually in the lead and center as well. And you know, for us, 
you know, my colleagues and both myself and Thais, we're from the community too. So I think that's also important to recognize. It's not just at the Absolutely. local all different levels too. Absolutely, thank you for that. And it's really exciting that you took evidence of discrimination. So we go back to the, the problem we always have about data, but you took evidence of, of discrimination that you had, that you collected, and you turned that into a project for change to bring equality where inequality exists. That's terrific. I see that uh, uh, Yara has joined us again. So Yara, we just uh, went a little bit further into the discussion, but we wanna come back to you and let's pick back up on your presentation of your okay. the program you're proud of. Yeah, thank, thank you. And uh, the other approach is about training. Uh, before we uh, provide training, we uh, conduct the assessment with the beneficiary LGBTQ people. So we uh, uh, provide training. Uh, training are free to attend. And the topic uh, mostly uh, about leadership, entrepreneur, setting business goal and plan, business operation management market and sell, financial literacy, how to assess to capital, touch and uh, social media. And uh, we often we invite special guests to, to share. And uh, we also ask uh, the beneficiary, the LGBT, to share their success story as well. And uh, we, we found out that peer learning can be very powerful. And uh, next slide. Uh, uh, so we also approach them to uh, assess the uh, capital uh, who are ready to start a small business. So we do, we do so by using the local microfinance institution uh, uh, in Cambodia and the supply chain uh, that uh, uh, they are ready uh, to uh, assess uh, uh, the, the credit. So uh, usually LGBTI people, uh, they struggle to secure uh, micro credit because they don't have any guarantee or guarantor or any ID document required. So they don't have a guarantor because they usually the family have rejected them from home and friend also uh, live in poverty. So they don't have uh, uh, everything. So they, they cannot normally assess uh, to the uh, capital. So that means that they remain uh, financially excluded. Equally, they are also a potential market list that uh, has not been explored by uh, microfinance institution. So we negotiated special and uh, conduction with the local uh, MF partner to overcome uh, this bear and allow them to assess uh, the, the micro credit. Yes, slide. Yeah, so uh, just giving, uh, just, just provide them skill, knowledge, and uh, uh, training them and give them capital to start uh, the business is not enough. So we uh, we provide regular uh, mentoring and follow up. So uh, facilitating start by capital and give people money to start a small business uh, is not really enough to uh, ensure success. We combine that with regular mentoring and follow up. So uh, starting a small business is very, very difficult and uh, several things will go along to the plan. People get sick, money gets stolen, people get evicted from their home, etc. So regular mentoring and follow up to, to us mean stay in touch with them in order to support them to deal with uh, issues as they arrive. So we give them call on monthly basis and we also visit them and their business. So we often uh, we are able to negotiate late repayment with the microfinance institution if something uh, unforeseen happens. So we provide support before, during, and uh, after the business startup. And, and, and last slide. So uh, our experience showed that by setting up the, the business, uh, 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 LGBT people gain more respect and inclusion from family and society. For example, Tida a trans man, he is accepted right by the family, setting up a small business for three years. So this is why uh, to us, economic empowerment is an entry point to equality because it creates change at the micro level of family and uh, community members. Uh, we have also noticed that uh, our program increased the number of people who become activists and advocate for uh, their own right as well. So uh, we use TV, radio, Facebook to showcase uh, our economic empowerment work and to change people's mindset and uh, uh, foster yeah, acceptance. Yeah. yeah. Okay, uh, 30 minutes last. <laughs> Next slide. 
Yeah, uh, our capacity in, in Cambodia is still limited. Uh, we uh, uh, few uh, power on power in 2020. We facilitate over 250,000 US dollar in micro loan to uh, 20 LGBTI people in poverty. And uh, the average loan is about 1,500. And uh, there are 94 repayment rates. So su success to us means uh, from rejection to re-inclusion in the family, decrease violence, and uh, increase the source of them and status in the community. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Yara. That's exciting. Uh, and especially showing us a peer mo uh, learning model uh, to try to address issues of microcredit and in turn addressing poverty reduction. So very practical and interesting. So I'm gonna go down back to the Q and A and I wanna have a question for Zimkita. Uh, Zimkita, you told us about your interesting program, but if you could also let us know what strategies you used or that you found successful specifically to reach LGB women entrepreneurs and also how PLUS aims to increase this supplier diversity among the corporate partners that you talked about. Okay, Over thank you, you so time. much. Thank you, Clifton. Okay, what has worked for us is also working with other corporates. You know, those 19 corporates that we, because we've realized that this is not a task that we can do on our own. One of the, the NGLCC has been a great help because he, they've introduced us to a lot of corporates. And one of those corporates has been a We Connect International, which is an international organization that supports also female owned businesses. They've got, I think about 300 uh, qualified um, suppliers in their database. So what they do is whenever they have RFQs, our members also have access to that. So they've been a great help. And also what is working for us is doing what I call um, go to town, doing a workshop services. In fact, working also with other, even government organizations, organizations like CIFA, which is a, it's a small enterprise development. Uh, it's like they've got funds to fund small businesses. Uh, especially businesses from previously disadvantaged. So for us, what is working is uh, relationships with corporates. Those are working for us because we get referrals, uh, we get corporates that are willing to work with um, LGBTI and also the NGLCC. So I think what's working mainly is the relationships that we build along. And also uh, we, programs that we are running. Uh, of course, COVID dealt us a huge blow last year because we had programs, outreach programs that we had planned for the year to go in different provinces where we would uh, invite uh, LGBTI owned businesses. Uh, we have what you call a, like an LGBTI business fair kind of thing where they come and display uh, whatever their services and uh, sort of like a flea market kind of thing. They'll have stalls where they have their services there. And also on the side, we have government departments, even banks where they will also teach about their services and whatever programs that I have available. So also what we are trying to do now is working with government, uh, we, started talks with the department in Cape Town, in the Western Cape, where we'll do sensitization training, starting from there. Because what we do, like we've got a client that we've done a sensitization, it, it was a mining company. We did a sensitization, LGBTI sensitization training for the staff at first. And then from there, we now move to the procurement, looking at their procurement, whether it's inclusive, are they making space for LGBTI owned businesses? So for us, really what's working is those relationships, working with other corporates, uh, because we are in a nonprofit organization. We don't have the funds to help. So collaborating with other, um, with other corporates or other, other organizations that are doing almost the same thing is a winner for us.
Uh, excuse me, Clifton, you're on mute. Uh, please just invite you to unmute your mic. Sorry, I think I muted myself. Uh, I want to turn next to Craig with a follow-up question for him. Uh, can you tell us, Craig, what factors have been most helpful in pursuing sustainable mid to long-term livelihood programs that are tailored to refugees in Kenya? Thank you. Thank you, Clifton. Um, for us, even from the start, uh, the, the main things that have been help, helping us that have put the program or uh, pushed the program to where it is right now has been just few. And this include um, the investment of capital. We've had several people who have invested in this program uh, from our reliable partners. From the start, All Out invested in this program and Oram currently is still a big investor of this program. So that has led us to even create the other things that we needed in the program. The other thing that has helped us is um, the consultation whereby potential partners or donors or people who want to uh, support this program have consulted the, the community, coming to the grassroots, talking to people who are on the ground, knowing what works and what doesn't work and listening to what we have to tell them. That has led to a stronger program. Um, the other thing that has helped us also has been the development of capacities through trainings. We've had several trainings in, uh, in skills development. Uh, we've uh, had trainings in, in uh, beauty and saloon. We've had trainings in poultry rearing. We've had trainings in uh, agribusiness. We've had trainings in administration and business admission and entrepreneurship. Um, we've had trainings in um, uh, finance and, and management. So these all trainings have equipped uh, the several people who are involved in the, in the programs to know how to even handle resources, to create market, um, to also create sustainability. The other thing that has also helped us in our program has been um, unifying the community because several people were scattered around. They, they didn't have uh, um, the networks that we have right now. Uh, so we had to mobilize the community. We had to look out for people. We had to send out surveys. We had to do needs assessments in the community. And this helped us to unify and create sort of community and uh, network for entrepreneurship. Uh, the other thing that has helped us also is the creation of markets. Um, we've tried, because well, with these programs that we had here, most of them, we had to create our own market. We had to look for market networks too. So those are the things that have helped us with our program. And we're still learning as we go, but so far so good. And we are still trying to scale up all those things that have worked. Thank you. That's terrific, Craig. Creation of markets and networks, very interesting. Barbara. Uh, you and I both know that the, the, the legal and policy environments that affect trans people in East Africa are not always optimal for helping with inclusion. So tell me, how do you all navigate challenging legal and policy environments in your part of the world? Yeah, the legal and policy environment in East Africa is very challenging. And we have very different contexts in each country. Kenya, for example, has made quite considerable strides in terms of supporting trans and gender diverse persons in different ways. For example, trans people are able to change their names legally and the courts did direct the relevant uh, body to ensure that trans people are able to do that. Um, trans people are also able to change their names and eliminate gender markers in their, in their school living certificates, uh, secondary school living certificates. And some of these things are actually positive, especially in relation to access to jobs and um, starting up businesses, because then a trans person can be able to 
you know, identify themselves in, in, in the way that they are. They can be able to get an, um, an identity card that has a picture of themselves and the name that they, they go by, which then, you know, reduces the chances of them being discriminated against in their, in their application for jobs and in their business startups. Um, however, when you're looking at other countries in the region, in Uganda, Tanzania, Rwanda, and Burundi, um, the situation is different. Like, for example, in Rwanda, while they do not have a specific law that to discriminate against LGBTQ persons, the society itself is discriminatory. The society itself um, doesn't see trans people or even queer people as worthy of the same respect and dignity as everybody else. And so we find a lot of discrimination that is meted against those people, like inside the, the community. And so those situations make it difficult for persons to engage in businesses, persons to be employed. And so um, we do find those challenges. Um, so what we do as, as a network is to work with our members in terms of improving their capacity to be able to advocate for the change of policies and, and, and laws. We use the success stories such as those ones in Kenya to motivate these other activists in, the, in these other countries to be able to do the same for their own regions. Um, we've seen considerable, you know, some changes, for example, with the intersex community in Kenya, in time, you know, they were able to, the government actually included them in the Kenyan census that took place a few, you know, a, a year or two ago. And, and that was a progress in and of itself. We've been able to see some cha legal changes in Uganda in regards to intersex persons, where intersex persons are, you know, removed from they're allowed to change their particulars as long as they're under 18. Um, and we are also seeing, you know, some advocacy work being done across the region, even when governments are restrictive. And in spaces where governments are restrictive, just such as in Tanzania, where we've seen a lot of challenges in the past, especially because of the, the previous uh, president, um, where now, our work is shifting towards maintaining, um, you know, safety and security, um, you know, reducing situations where you have to engage with like uh, law enforcement, but also um, training yourself and learning new different ways of doing advocacy, um, different ways of influencing change, even if it is working with local communities. Um, you find that in our region, we like, for example, in Tanzania, you've there are um, local community leaders that are set up. Um, I think it's called, uh, sorry, I, I literally it just dropped into, oh, okay. out of my head. Absolutely. Um, but but that's, that's it. Like um, for us, what we focus on, because we don't, do a, we don't do any work in country. We don't do actual advocacy work on the country level. What we do is to facilitate our members in learning, in sharing their experiences, in providing support to each other. So that then if we've seen any successes that have been done in one space, then we can try and replicate those things in other spaces. Absolutely. If we are seeing that there's progress in, say, for example, the lesbian, gay, bisexual community that affects the trans movement, then we, we connect to these spaces so that then if there's any work that is being done, like, for, for example, work towards eliminating um, forced inner examinations, that that also applies to trans people. Absolutely. So I think that's, that's, what, that's what has Let, helped. Let's turn to Yara, Barbara, but it's, I mean, Clearly, what you're describing is a very difficult uh, uh, environment when it comes to law and policy, but that the struggle continues, and thank goodness for Ethan. Yara, can you tell us how you measure success? Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, to us, success means uh, uh, the anniversary, they increase the family ties. It means that the family asks them to get back uh, to their home uh, after the, the family rejection. Secondly, they increase uh, community uh, status and they uh, increase uh, acceptance in the community. And thirdly, they uh, could go back to school, 
they can have friends, they uh, uh, they can do some what uh, they want and identify themselves in the community and in the public. Excellent, thank you very much. Uh, we are running out of time, but I have one more question. I'm gonna to go to each panelist. You're gonna have 30 seconds to a minute to give us your best succinct answer to this. I know that's unfair, but so is the loss of time or the, or the, or the limitations of time. And I'm gonna let you choose to, to answer the question you think most relevant for you. I'm quite interested. I think the audience is quite interested in understanding how COVID has impacted your programming uh, and the community you serve. Uh, or you can tell us how one creates safe spaces uh, because a number of you talked about in different ways, the importance of space, safe spaces uh, in, in terms of the processes and what you're trying to achieve. So choose one or the other, impacts of COVID on your programming in your community, or how one creates effective safe spaces for your community and your programs. And remember, you, this is the short answer, so you have about a minute each. And I'm gonna start, let's start from the bottom this time in terms of where we went before. Yara, why don't you go first, COVID or safe spaces? Okay, uh, thank you. Uh in terms of COVID, uh, we locked down some time. So we practice the principle of municipal health and we wearing masks and wash them properly. And sometimes we cannot meet the community. We can uh, not mobilize physical even. So uh, we conduct activity and take time more than uh, expected. Uh, uh, so uh, sometimes we lost some connection and working with the community. And uh, some community cannot reach out to us. So that's all the problem and uh, uh, community lost job. They return from the migration. They don't have something of food to eat. Uh, they just stay at home. Uh, something like that's all the impact to the community and our work. No, and Barbara, to you on the same one of either of those questions. Um, yeah. I think COVID has affected the community and I think that's the kind pressing issue. We've seen a lot of people who have lost their jobs, who've lost their sources of income. We've seen trans women who used to en who engage in sex work have, have been unable to do that because of social distancing um, rules and, and lockdowns. Um, we've seen a lot of queer people, trans people having to go back to their homes homes where they've been discriminated against, homes where they are forced to conform to what the family wants them to be. And just being, you know, just also organizations have struggled because funding has been directed to COVID. And so there's very little funding that actually goes to general support, paying rent, paying salaries, you know, some organizations have had to close down just because of the situation. So, yeah. Thank you for that, Barbara. Uh, and let's then go up to, uh, I'm going to jump to the top now. Uh, Nanu, why don't you say, tell us something either about this issue of safe spaces or the COVID impacts in your program? Oh, there we go. Right. Okay. Um, I'm going to attempt both. So on COVID, we were actually lucky to um, transfer the program online and digitally. So we were able to train a, a larger group of um, beneficiaries and participants and have a wider scope in terms of um, engagement from uh, more states. And the, we also, ex that also allowed us to expand the program and provide more modules into the, uh, into the training program as well. Um, it was, and we were able to also provide um, um, psychosocial support by going online. Uh, just to also note that one thing I did not mention, all our programs do provide a scholarship as well. So, you know, you're taking trans people out of the informal economy, out of you know, subsistence work, and, you know, putting them into training scholarships have to be provided there. So just wanted to note that. On safe spaces, it's very important to note that what we do is in the programs themselves, we have representatives from civil LGBTI civil society programs moderating the courses throughout. And then when we identify potential training partners or institutions, we actually train everyone. And we make sure that that institution is safe for LGBTIQ plus people. It's, um, it has the right reasonable accommodation and measures in place. By training everyone, we mean everyone from the security guards to the cleaners, to the heads, everyone is trained, we must be aware LGBTI plus issues. Now, under the second phase of the project, which is going to be funded by, which is good. Very quickly, Danu. 
Global Equality Fund, we will be developing further training on safe spaces digitally, as well as physical safety and security measures as well. So looking forward to the to upscaling this project, but thanks to uh, uh, the Global Equality Fund. Great, thank you so much. Uh, Zimkita, same two questions to you and, and choose to which one you wanna answer. Okay, I'll go for the safe space. Um, I believe creating safe spaces, one, you start by educating because there's a whole lot we take for granted when it comes to LGBTI community. So it starts by educating those around you and also sensitizing people of their right use of a language. You know, sometimes you refer to them, you know, whereas we should use, start using the inclusive language so that you make sure that people feel safe to come anyone for that matter they can talk to you because you 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 are safe to talk to you're not gonna discriminate you're not gonna judge so for me safe space start by education educating people those around you and also creating an environment uh, reaching out in fact to communities and uh, in fact more educating 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 Thank you. Thank you, Katie, 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 Katie. I like that. And, 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 so, and so finally to you, Craig, uh, why don't you address one of those two questions? So uh, Clifton, I'll address the one uh, about what has worked for us and just to encourage everyone, maybe we could pick a lesson or two. So here in Kenya, in the LGBTIQ refugee community, what has really worked is one, the mobilization of leadership. Uh, since people needed a channel or people to uh, channeled resources too. So we started mobilizing people, capable people, people who are willing to learn, also to create uh, sustainability here. And the other thing we did was to mobilize networks. We reached out to people, to potential donors, to potential supporters, people from our community, people from the LGBTQ movement, and people from elsewhere. And this has helped us to even bring uh, resources, human resources to all this program. And it's really helped push our program. Uh, the other thing is um, capacity development, having several intense trainings in skills development, uh, in business administration has really worked and it has helped people with even managing their, their businesses. Um, the other thing uh, that has helped us is the sensitization of the community. I know my colleague mentioned it there, but it has also helped us on how um, we, we even navigate the community here, the homophobia, the transphobia around in Kenya, while we still be sensitizing the community. And lastly, uh, creating dialogue with the authorities here, yeah, people who are responsible for everyone in the country. And that's one of the things that have helped us uh, succeed here. Thank you. Terrific, Craig. And it's two things that are not gonna go away anytime soon that, uh, that we're gonna be needing to address. One is COVID, one is the need for safe spaces. And then Craig brought us back in some ways to another important part of the discussion is the, the importance of networks and alliances and all of these projects and this work. And I also learned that we just don't have enough time to talk about these kinds of great programs. So we need to consider that in future when we do this kind of thing again, we need more time to talk about these programs. So with that, I'm gonna turn back over to you, Camille. Thank you so much, Cliff. Um, thank you for moderating and a big thank you to all of our panelists, Simkita, Craig, Manu, Barbara, and Yara. This was such a rich discussion. I know I'm still going to be included in your initiatives and activities. This should be the beginning of a conversation among your organizations for how to ensure that the human rights of LGBTQI plus people are protected and the principles of do no harm and do nothing about them without them can be upheld in programs. So please do continue to follow both marketlinks.org and USAID's LGBTQI plus work within the Inclusive Development Hub at usaid.gov slash slash LGBTQI. Some follow-up resources, including the recording of today's event, will be sent to all of those who registered. So thank you again for joining us and I'll pass the mic back over to Janina to close us out. Thank you so much, Camille. And thank you again, 
uh, to all of our really wonderful presenters for the day. In just a few moments to all of our participants, you will see a couple of polls that will appear on your screen. We do ask that before you leave today, you just share a little bit about your reflections from today's session about whether or not it improved your understanding of the subject matter um, and whether or not you would recommend this session to others. On the screen, we do have the con contact information for all of our uh, panelists, and we do invite you to go ahead and reach out to them if you would like any additional follow-up materials. With that being said, we will leave the room open for the next few minutes for you to gather information uh, as needed and to reply to the polls, and we will close the room momentarily. Thank you so much, everyone, and enjoy the rest of your day, no matter where your feet may find you. The IRC has been... Hello, once again, my friends, thank you for staying on. Uh, we do invite you to copy the information on the screen if you'd need it. Uh, we will close the room shortly, but if you'd like to exit out of this screen, you may do so by clicking the red X at the top of your layout as you would with any other browser. Enjoy the rest of your day and take care. <laughs>